So let's have a look at DJI's latest creation, the Osmo Pocket. Now this is a consumer device that is being marketed at the masses. It's not really a professional device, but that's not to say that you couldn't use it for certain shots and uh, certain situations where you need a small discreet camera or simply this is the only option you may have with you at the time. Now I'm going to look at image quality, I'm going to look at how it performs in low light, run you through how the menus work and also uh, how the app works. There are only two buttons on the pocket, a record button and a multi-purpose button that acts as the power on off, menu button and as a function button when you are shooting. There is also a kind of locking hot shoe style interface where the lightning connector or USB-C connector and other accessories can be attached. When you are shooting, the multi-purpose button does three things. A single press of the button toggles between video and stills mode. If you press the button twice, you recenter the gimbal and camera. If you press it three times, you flip the gimbal into selfie mode. On the right hand side of the pocket is the micro SD slot where you just slide the card in and then you can pop it back out uh, when you have finished shooting. On the bottom of the Osmo Pocket there is a USB port. Now this is for charging and also for some of the accessories that uh, will be coming out. The Osmo has a integrated one inch touchscreen that is reasonably high quality and can act as a live view as well as allowing you to toggle through the various shooting modes, adjust settings and also review your footage. The inbuilt screen is postage stamp size and you can't realistically expect to be able to judge anything more than framing on it. I do like that the pocket does have a screen because at least you can see what's being recorded and frame up your shots. The weird thing about the touchscreen is that it displays a 4x3 image and not a 16x9 one so it does make it a little bit difficult when you are trying to frame things. Up. Speaking of the touch screen, it's very responsive to the touch and easy to use. DJI has done a nice job with the interface on such a tiny screen. It all works by swiping left, swiping right, swiping up, swiping down. This gets you into the various different menus where you can make changes uh, to your Osmo. While the controls are pretty good on the touch screen, they are somewhat limiting and you really do need to use the app on a smartphone to make a lot of the key changes. There is no way on the touch screen of changing, let alone seeing key information like shutter speed, ISO and white balance. You also can't change between the auto and manual video shooting modes. If you've made a manual setting with the smartphone attached and you then disconnect your phone, the Osmo Pocket will keep those same settings. You can change the resolution and frame rates by swiping left once you're in the video menu. Strangely, this only allows you to choose between 30 or 60p. There's no options to choose 24, 25, 48 or 50p. If you want to shoot in those resolutions, you then need to select them using the Mimo app. Hopefully this will change in a firmware update. So how is the image quality of the Osmo Pocket? Well, it really comes down to what you're shooting and the conditions you're using it in. Sometimes it can look really good and other times it can look downright terrible. So here's just some example footage. None of this has been graded or touched. This is exactly as it was coming out of the camera. I haven't done anything to it whatsoever, just so you can see exactly what you are going to get in terms of um, image quality. As you can see in conditions like this, it looks all right. Again here, this is fairly sort of uh, neutral lighting early in the morning and I'm actually just uh, riding along on a push bike here and holding onto the, um, the smartphone attached to the Osmo Pocket. So here's a much more difficult shot. I'm going straight into the sun here and you can see it takes on quite a lot of color cast. The flare is fairly ugly. I mean, this is really testing the limits of any type of um, camera. And at situations like this where you will find that the, the Osmo uh, pocket will fall over. Here it's just pointing straight up and I'm just walking backwards shooting up into the trees and as, as you can see you can get fairly nice results um, doing this. Again here I'm just riding the bike here through the people. I'm just seeing how the gimbal performs and uh, at a bit of speed and uh, in terms of the image quality and it's doing an okay job here. Um, if we track around the corner here it's still uh, retaining uh, you know, good balance and it's keeping nice and steady on a platform um, like this. Uh, you know, Im the image in conditions like this is all right. Again, in nice lighting conditions like this is, is where it will look nice, um, particularly with uh, you know, scenes like this. If we do come out here where it's a little bit uh, more tricky, 
it's going to fall over a little bit in terms of being so backlit. Again, we're just going to track people. And you can see here, this is this problem you sometimes get with the gimbal where it sort of just like sort of pushes over slightly a little bit, sort of corrects itself and sort of ruins your shot to a certain extent. Now, again, this is not a super tricky um, sort of shot, but there is a lot going on in here. So we're just having a look at uh, how it's going. Again, this is, uh, you know, looking back, this is quite a high dynamic range scene as we sort of got shadows and a lot of light coming in uh, early morning here. We're just tracking along and as you can see, it's, it's okay. There is a lot of compression issues when you can, if you're looking closely with all the sort of the fine detail and stuff. This is just a tracking um, shot where I'm uh, using the object tracking on the, the old man who's walking here. Um, again, this is uh, not really sort of testing the camera too heavily in terms of the scene. Um, it's fairly well controlled in terms of the dynamic range, etc, etc. But you, you will see it moving over a lot of fine detail here, all those leaves and things. You will see start to see compression um, artifacts. And you can see that nasty flare that uh, is very reminiscent of what you get on, on DJI drones. He's just going from uh, low mode to high mode. Again, um, you know, it looks okay, but as soon as you start shooting into the sun in conditions like this, you'll see that it starts sort of overpowering the image um, quite badly and it doesn't look particularly good. Now, I won't talk over everything. I've sort of shown you what works and what doesn't work, and you can just have a look at the images and you can see uh, how it looks in various lighting conditions and scenarios and, and make up your mind as to uh, the quality of the images you can obtain with the Osmo Pocket.
Here's some shots with the gimbal just being used without the smartphone and the app, and this is just in the full auto mode, um, just so you can have a look. And I've kept the sound on so you can sort of hear the quality of the, the microphones that are uh, being used on the pocket. Finally, just here's a running shot. I'm just holding onto it, running up the street. And you can see there's a fair bit of bounce. Not doing a great job uh, when I'm running with it here. A lot of shake and not particularly great gimbal stabilisation happening when, when you're running. You can see that side-to-side -side movement that's happening as well. Now, I did do some tests with the slow motion capabilities of the Osmo Pocket, but I'm going to include that in another video because it can only be done in 1080 and I'm not going to put that on a uh, UHD timeline. So look out for that video. Now as far as the audio quality goes, the Osmo Pocket has two inbuilt microphones, but the audio quality is not great. I would only really use it as a scratch microphone. Uh, it's not really great for anything else. So here's just a simple audio test. I uh, don't have it on the automatic settings and I'm just holding it um, about 30-40 centimeters from in front of my face. If you use the Pocket without a smartphone in the app, you don't get any audio meters uh, at all that come up on the display screen here, which makes it really hard to, to know what's uh, being recorded in terms of the audio. So let's have a look at how to use the Mimo app with the DJI Osmo Pocket. Now when you open it up, this is the screen that you are greeted by. Very sort of reminiscent of other DJI products, maybe not as much information on the screen as you would see with one of DJI's drones, but again, quite a simple uh, layout and it's fairly easy to use. And being targeted as a consumer product, it has to really be easy to use. Now, you can see we've got our focus box here. This is either, uh, you can do it in single or continuous autofocus. When it's grabbed focus, you'll get that uh, larger line around there. You can also lock it by holding onto that button and then that'll lock the focus in place no matter where you move it, it'll be locked on that that particular uh, focal point, uh, which is nice to be able to do. In terms of resolution and frame rates here, you can see we can do 24, 25, 30, 48, 50, and 60 in 1920 by 1080, as well as 38, 40 by 21, 60. Now you've got a quality control, you can do that between fine and super fine. Now if you press super fine, you'll see you get that warning that comes up on the screen. Now super fine can only be done in frame rates up to 30p. If you try and select uh, 50 or 60p, you'll see it gets grayed out and it's not available. The difference between fine and super fine is very marginal. It's a slight bump up in the uh, bit rate of the codec, but not enough to really uh, notice a massive big difference um, as far as I'm concerned in terms of the difference in the quality. You can either choose to shoot in manual or auto modes. Now, as you can see, if we're in the manual mode, our ISO and shutter um, are locked. So if I move it around here, you'll see it's going to overexpose the image because it's keeping the ISO and the shutter locked in those um, settings that I've got on there. Now, if I turn it back over onto auto, here you'll see what happens is it's now automatically doing adjustments uh, based on what it thinks uh, the ISO and the shutter speed uh, should be. Now, back in manual mode, we can choose our ISO levels from auto 100 all the way up to 3200, which is uh, nice. I'd probably use it at 100 or 200. The shutter speed can go anywhere from 1 8,000th, one sorry, all the way down to 125 in video mode. Uh, it's a lot nicer being able to use the manual uh, functions because you can actually sort of lock in uh, exactly what you'd like to shoot with uh, instead of relying on the auto. Now, if we go to video here, now if we are in the manual, mode we do get these options here so there's anti-flicker volume amplification level 
noise reduction, grid overexposed histogram and focus mode. The volume application level is just different levels that you can actually sort of set the internal microphones at. It's sort of labeled in a weird sort of way and they don't make a massive big difference I found in, in terms of doing it. There's sort of a replacement to a volume uh, control. There's also noise reduction um, which you can turn on and off and there's also grid lines here. So there's two different types of uh, grid lines that you can see that you can choose uh, you know if you need to use them for any particular uh, reason. There's a thing called overexposed which is quite sort of it's basically just zebras and I think the zebras are set at a hundred percent so anything that's uh, got zebras on it is getting overexposed so that's just uh, one of the exposure tools that you can use along here with the histogram. Histogram is nice to have you can also drag it around and place it anywhere on the screen. Uh, a nice way of uh, making sure you can get a nice balanced exposure with your image. You can also uh, just click it and get rid of it, uh, doing it that way. Very easy uh, indeed. Now if we go back in here too, we can see we've got focus modes and we've got single point autofocus or continual autofocus. I prefer to use the um, single point autofocus. I found the continual autofocus, you know, while it works okay, it is a little slow and if you were shooting in um, contrasty conditions or conditions where um, you know things are not exactly nice even lighting it does struggle a lot it sort of hunts around and sort of loses loses focus I find it's much easier just to use the single point uh, autofocus because you just tap on the screen much like you would do with a, a DJI drone and I think it's it's a lot better way and it's actually a lot quicker to get correct focus using the single tap um, uh, autofocus system instead of doing the uh, the continual. Uh, very easy to do that one as well. Um, now if we go back out here into our next setting which is uh, here you can see we can choose between fast follow which allows you to move the gimbal around quite quickly if you're following action and slow follow which you can see is a lot more gradual movement uh, of the gimbal. Then we've got tilt lock uh, which is a nice way of getting nice even shots. Locks the tilt axis. Um, I found this is probably the best way to get smooth shots with the gimbal. There's an FPV mode which you can see you can sort of move it around in any direction you want and sort of floats. It's nice for the occasional sort of shot. Now using the app you can actually just physically pan and tilt the gimbal around in any direction you want and you can do it at different types of speeds works reasonably well I wouldn't say it's the smoothest thing it sort of takes off when you f first do it but it's a nice way of doing little pans uh, and tilts if you can get the speed right uh, you know it's nice to have in there and it allows you to do um, you know some creative shots that uh, are a little bit easier than trying to move the gimbal around in some situations now if we go into the slow motion mode you'll see we get a pretty sizable crop I'd say it's probably around about a two times crop now this is 1080 um, at 120p but it's actually been recorded in a 30p wrapper it's a little bit strange because there's no option to record in or have it record in 24 or 25 or anything else it's only in 30p wrapper and it's 120 frames per second there's also a time lapse mode here this is really actually nice you can set the interval um, the difference between three seconds all the way up to 60 seconds and then you can also change the duration of how long you want to uh, actually record for and then what's really nice as well is you can do this path so you can add a maximum of four points so you just put it into the spot where you want it to start and you press uh, the add button then you move the gimbal to another spot that you want it to go to press it again move it to another spot then add another one and then finally go over and press it again so then over that duration of whatever you set the gimbal will actually follow that path and uh, and record a time lapse uh, in that way. Nice feature to, to, to have that's inbuilt into the gimbal. Now if we go uh, back out again, sorry I'm back into the video mode, you can see we, this is basic and pro modes uh, that we're back in here again. This is where you can choose your video format. And you can see if we go to basic, it's only MOV and MP4 and limited options there, only anti-flicker, anti-flicker, sorry, grid and overexposed, the only options you've got when using basic um, more options obviously if you use the Pro. Uh, speaking of Pro you can also do uh, white balance so auto, sunny, cloudy, incandescent, fluorescent and also custom which is uh, quite nice you can put it all the way down from 2000 Kelvin all the way up to 10,000 Kelvin in small sort of 100k 
um, increments there. It's a nice way of fine tuning and getting the balance a little bit closer. Uh, it would have been nice to be able to do a manual white balance, but it is a consumer product, so I'll give DJI a pass uh, with that one. Now you can view all your media by going into the play icon and you'll see it'll load up all the uh, clips that you've got on here and you can scroll through all of them and then you can just find uh, whatever one you want to look at. Um, it loads up fairly quickly and then you can just uh, open it up and then press play. As you can see I can now see my clip and then I can also press this information button which gives me a nice amount of uh, relevant information in terms of uh, the time it was shot, the resolution, the frame rate, um, etc, etc. Um, you can also export from here. You'll see if you scroll through, there's a slight little bit of delay in terms of it picking back up, but it's a, a nice way of being able to view clips straight away uh, on, your, on your smartphone. Uh, you can also export them straight out from here. You can like them and you can also trash uh, things if you need to as well, if you want to get rid of uh, particular shots um, straight off the card while it's inside the uh, gimbal. So how does the Osmo Pocket fare when it comes to low light performance? Well, let's have a look and find out. Now, DJI devices have never been known as low light monsters, and that's certainly the case here uh, with the Osmo Pocket. This shot here is at 400 ISO. Uh, it's just around dusk time. Um, I'm still running 1 50th of a shutter here, but I've pushed the ISO to 400, which doesn't sound like a lot, but on devices like this, uh, it is a little bit higher than uh, what you would normally be running uh, during the daytime. Uh, it does a reasonable job at 400. This is sort of about the limit that I would probably want to use you know, this product at for most shots. Yes, you can push it up to 800 and you know, even 1600 in a pinch, but then you will start to see quite a lot of noise. This is sort of at the that sort of level where I'd be comfortable with, where it's still handling things okay. Um, as soon as you start raising the ISO up too much, you start seeing uh, quite a loss of resolution and also quite a lot of um, you know color casts and the image sort of degrading pretty badly uh, in general. Here at 400, it still maintains a, a you know pretty good performance. There is a little bit more noise, obviously, but uh, it's still doing okay. Now here you can see this is now 800 ISO, so we're raising it up even more. Now you will be able to see quite a bit of noise. Here's that same shot we've zoomed in 200% on it and you can see there's quite a lot of noise uh, in the shadows. And uh, you'll notice here again, this is the same shot, well, a similar shot at 800 ISO. And you can see the noise in the dark areas there and sort of problems you're getting with compression and it's just not really handling this uh, very nicely at all. You're really sort of pushing the limits. So here now, this is 1600 ISO, so we're really starting to push it up and you can start to see that, uh, you know, there's a lot of degradation in, in the areas where there's shadows or the mid-tones or you can especially see with the fine patterns on the water and the bricks, there's a lot of noise being introduced here. Um, this is a 200% crop on that same shot going in and it's, it's not great. Um, you know, you probably wouldn't want to use it at 1600. Here's that same shot again. Now this is with the noise reduction turned on. Now I didn't really notice a massive difference between having the noise reduction on and the re noise reduction off. It doesn't look that much different to me. If anything, it's probably just uh, causing a little bit of lack of sharpness and detail and sort of smoothing that out. I think you, you sort of lose that with the noise reduction turned on. Just to double check, let's have a look at those two 1600 um, shots side by side. The noise reduction on is up the top, noise reduction off at the bottom. And as you can see, there's not a great deal of difference between these two images. Now, if we go to 3200 ISO, um, you can see here there is considerable noise, uh, particularly in the shadows and the mids. If we crop in 200% on that same shot, you can start to see just how bad that image is starting to fall apart at, uh, at 3200 in terms of noise and compression issues. Now this is 3200 with the noise reduction on. Again, I don't think the noise reduction makes a massive difference. I, I can't really see any difference between uh, having it on and having it off. I don't see any big advantage in, in having it on at all. Again, now let's just crop into that image 200%. This is 3200 with the noise reduction on. And as you can see, it doesn't look that much different to what we were seeing before on a 200% crop with the noise reduction uh, turned off. 
And just finally with these tests here, I'm just going to run a couple of other shots that I did at 3200 ISO, which is the limit of the Osmo Pocket, just so you can get a bit of an idea of uh, what to expect if you were going to shoot at uh, this sort of ISO, which I probably wouldn't recommend. Um, as you can see here, here's another shot. This is in mixed sort of lighting conditions, and you can really see the noise and the, the compression issues, particularly with a moving shot. Um, like this, so the camera is not really coping very well with all these different uh, light sources and different color temperatures. And uh, on fast moving uh, shots, as I said before, you're going to see a lot of noise and it's the compression issues are going to uh, start to rear their ugly head. Again, one more shot here at 3200, um, pretty dark. Uh, the Osmo Pocket really does try and uh, I think crush the shadows and mids quite a lot to try and hide some of that noise but at these sort of ISOs it's pretty hard to uh, to hide them. So how does the image compare to an iPhone? Well I set out to do a couple of quick tests between the Osmo Pocket and the iPhone 7 Plus. So here's the DJI Osmo Pocket. Now these are all done in 30p UHD at their uh, auto settings and as you can see there's a bit of difference here between the two images. Here we go split screen you can see the Apple um, iPhone 7 Plus is a lot colder image, the DJ Osmo is warmer and also there's a lot more detail um, and sharpness in the image of the Osmo Pocket. As you can see here this is a 200% crop in now on that same shot and you can really see the difference here where the Osmo Pocket is vastly outperforming the, the iPhone. So here's the DJI Osmo Pocket, we're just seeing how it handles highlights and the sort of transition it does in the auto mode. And here's the iPhone 7 Plus. And you can see the iPhone 7 Plus is considerably brighter in its auto mode in terms of not crushing the mids and blacks as much. Here's the split screen and you can really see the difference there between the, the two shots in terms of what's happening. Now in mixed lighting conditions, here's the Osmo Pocket and you can see it takes a while for it to adjust going down here. It's quite noisy, uh, ramping up, and it's got quite a bit of a color cast. You can see here on the uh, iPhone 7 Plus, a lot more neutral looking in image. It's not taking on that color tones. Uh, the noise is uh, probably fairly similar. Again, here's a split screen, so you can see the difference between the two and what's happening. And you can see the iPhone looks a lot more natural, and the transition is a lot better in these auto modes. Again, here's a crop in freeze frame of the noise and you can see that the Osmo Pocket uh, has a lot more noise here but it's also a lot sharper. Despite some of its limitations, I really like the Osmo Pocket. It's just a really cool product that's bound to find its way under a lot of Christmas trees this year. Even though it costs $349, which is expensive for a consumer product like this, I still think it will sell in droves. You just have to have a look at how many people bought drones. No, it doesn't have any picture profiles, it can't shoot in log, it's not particularly great in mixed light, it doesn't handle highlights particularly well, and the gimbal performance could be better. But you know what? None of that really matters. The size, convenience factor, and capabilities of the Osmo Pocket make you forget about what it can't do and remind you of what it can do. The Osmo Pocket is a bit of a jack of all trades, master of none. It's a capable device that I think a lot of shooters will buy just to keep in their kit. I like to think of it as a nice emergency camera that I can keep in my pocket or bag and pull out in situations when I need to shoot something that isn't possible with another camera.